Hello and welcome to the History Show on Near 90 FM. My name is Cahill Brennan and on this episode of the History Show we will be talking to James Dorney about when Angel Street became known as the Dardanelles. But first myself and my co-presenter John Dorney will be talking to Dr Aoife McCormack about her research on infectious diseases in Ireland through the ages. Aoife McCormack works at the Biomedical Diagnostics Institute at Dublin City University. It is an SFI funded research centre that looks at disease diagnosis and monitoring. Hello Aoife, can you tell me about this project? Hi Cahill, certainly. Well, this year Dublin is the European City of Science. Um, We're actually hosting the European Science Forum, known as ESOF. So there are all sorts of exciting science-related events on. You probably saw the St. Patrick's Day parade have a science theme. And at the moment in the BDI, we're currently in the process of creating a kind of digital timeline of certain infectious diseases in Ireland and how people responded to them, both scientifically and socially. And we hope to make it very visual and informative and, of course, interesting. Um, As part of it as well, we are hoping to showcase some of the great scientific research that's gone on in Ireland and carried out by Irish people over the years in this kind of area of disease and diagnostics, because there's a lot of kind of great research that's gone on that uh, people have probably not heard much about. Hi, Aoife. Can you tell us what is a pandemic? Hiya, John. So a pandemic basically is an outbreak of disease, but people probably have heard the word epidemic before, but a pandemic would be kind of more global. It's basically when a disease kind of begins to cross borders and spread into, you know, other countries and uh, go worldwide, whereas an epidemic would be a little more localised, even though it would be an outbreak of disease, it would be within a certain area. And pandemics certainly, you know, have the ability to cause great harm. Mm-hmm. A pandemic, by its nature, is probably quite a rare event, but when it does happen, it has a pretty dramatic effect on human history. Would that be fair? Oh, absolutely. I would say so. I mean, all through the kind of years, there's reports of, you know, kind of uh, pandemics throughout history that have probably had a great, great effect on, uh, you know, human history and kind of politics wise, history wise, everything. So, yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Could you give us some examples of some of the major pandemics in history and what kind of effect they've had? Sure. Well, there's, uh, I suppose, talking about the kind of the Black Death itself, the bubonic plague, which people will probably have heard about. There was one particular plague which took place in uh, 541 to 542, known as the Justinian Plague. Researchers now think that was probably caused by the bubonic plague or the Black Death as well. There was another major pandemic of the Black Death in 1349, and then a later one in the 1800s as well. These were kind of three major um, pandemics of the Black Death, which certainly would have had great effects on human history. And there, of course, these caused the, the fall of empires, they caused massive shifts in, in population and things like this. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. I, I think with the Justinian plague, I, I think it had a great effect on the Roman Empire. And the Black Death in 1349 certainly really wiped out a lot of Europe's population. Uh, They think it could be anywhere up to a third to a half that it actually reduced the population of Europe by. So it certainly, you know, have have great effects in these ways. Uh, The pandemic in the 1800s, actually, that started in Asia um, and kind of went worldwide, actually killed nearly 10 million people in India alone. So they really can have great effects on on human population and movement. So what diseases were you specifically looking at yourself? We were looking at the Black Death in Ireland, so or the plague. We also looked at uh, tuberculosis and uh, the influenza, as well as foot and mouth disease, which would be more recent. And we're also kind of looking at current diseases that would have an effect in Ireland. So we're kind of looking at you know, kind of the history, but we're bringing it up to the current day as well. So it's quite interesting. So can you tell us about what the Black Death actually is and how was it spread? So it's actually a bacterial infection that's carried by fleas. The particular bacteria on the flea is known as Yersinia pestis. And what happens is, is that once it gets kind of ingested by the flea, it kind of grows in its gut. And you can see quite clearly, like the photos of fleas that are infected, they've got this kind of black mass in their gut. And then what happens is, is that when the flea actually tries to bite a host, its gut is kind of impacted, so it can't actually ingest any blood and it kind of regurgitates it back into the host. 
So basically the host, like a human, would become infected then. And the thing is, is that the flea is actually, it's actually the rat flea that carries it. So it's spread by rats, which of course in medieval times would have travelled in ships and then, of course, it can uh, easier spread uh, to kind of human hosts. Uh, rats and humans have always lived in kind of pro- close proximity to each other. Another reason is is that it wasn't only kind of rats, uh, but also the flea can live quite easily in kind of things like cloth and grain for e- up to three months. So if these kind of goods were being transported, the, the flea carrying the bacteria could have been uh, easily spread, you know, throughout the world as well. Can you just tell us what years that this affected Ireland, the period that you're looking at? Well, the period that we're actually looking at is kind of 1347 to 1350. And this was, as I say, it was a global event. It was a pandemic. It's believed that it originated in China and kind of swept across Europe kind of around 1347. And it followed the kind of main trade route. Um, It's really well documented throughout throughout Europe by the club chroniclers of the time. With regards to the plague in lots of parts of Central Europe, Mm -hmm. um, Britain, there was this tendency to blame the plague on the Jews and Jewish communities. Mm -hmm. In your Mm -hmm. research, have you noticed any of that anti-Semitism in Ireland? Uh, Yeah, funnily enough, uh, well, there isn't a lot of sources, but from the sources that I was reading, this was certainly prominent in Europe, you know, there was awful cases of Jews being burnt alive because they were blamed for the plague and everything, especially in Central Europe. But it funny enough doesn't seem to be as bad even in England as it was in Europe. And there's almost no record of it really in Ireland. But then again, there are very few reports. Uh, on the, the there's very few accounts of the plague in Ireland at this time. It's it was quite difficult to figure it out, but it it seems to have been not as kind of you know bad in England and Ireland. This type of kind of blaming it on a certain people. There was certainly some you know blaming it on the sin of the people. There's reports of that, and there's a lot of sermons that kind of state that. In it, there's records of that going on, but not so much of kind of blaming a particular people for it. Uh, the plague, the Black Death, arrived in Ireland in the port towns, is that right? Yes, absolutely. I mean, as I said, it was carried by rats and uh, probably fleas living in certain goods. So it, they think that it may have started in kind of uh, Hoats or Dalky, probably in that area. And then other port towns began to show signs of infections, places like kind of Waterford, uh, Yall, Cork, all of these kind of got hit very hard in the, in the first instance. Mm-hmm. And how bad was the plague or the Black Death in Ireland? The sources are very scarce. Um, and Maria Kelly has actually written a great book on this. Um, and she must have had quite a difficult time because there's there's very few kind of first-hand accounts of it. But in particular, there was one monk actually by the name of Friar John Clinn. He was in the Friars Minor in Kilkenny. And he gives us a very good kind of first-hand account of the disease in Ireland. So he kind of records that it started over in the east and quickly spread to kind of Dublin and Drogheda, where it really wreaked havoc in, in, in Dublin and Drogheda. They, they think that, it, you know, it possibly, there's some estimates that it's even wiped out a third to a half of the population of, uh, of Dublin. And basically, that's where it kind of started. And he kind of chronicles this, you know, moving a little bit across the country to Kilkenny. In particular, he records kind of deaths of, friars along the way because there was he reports one day in particular where eight friars died in one day of the of the plague and he kind of he does say that in some of the kind of towns along the ways there was scarcely anybody left so it seems that it did really hit hit some places in Ireland very hard so what was the effects of the Black Death on the ordinary people in Ireland? I guess at that time there was it, it was kind of a politically complex situation in Ireland so there was a lot of war, you know, kind of war going on. There was, uh, there'd been famine. There was a lot of poverty. There were other diseases that were around, uh, of course, and uh, people would, uh, women would die young in childbirth. So it, it was, it was a hard enough time as it was. Basically, already you were kind of lucky if you made it to your uh, late twenties. Basically, um, and especially with the conditions that would have been like, you know. It, it, There would have been poor sanitation, poor housing, so the plague would have spread very easily. And, you know, it was quite a very, very unpleasant disease, really. And people, they they think that people might have been weakened. There was a famine that had occurred maybe, I I think, 20 years beforehand. 
and they think people that would have been children uh, when the famine years were there would have been weakened by the time that the, the plague hit them when they were adults. They would have had very little immunity to it. Aoife, uh, can you tell us what the symptoms of the plague were? When people say kind of the Black Death or the plague, there's actually three different forms. So there is bubonic, which people have probably heard of, you know, usually when they say the Black Death, it was the bubonic plague. Uh, there is pneumonic and there's septicemic. And they're, they're all quite serious. They're all very unpleasant. But it's really the pneumonic and the septicemic have nearly 100% mortality rates. I mean, it's, it, it's very rare that somebody would have survived it without treatment. The bubonic plague is still a high mortality rate. It still had a, you know, maybe 60%, but at least you kind of had a chance that you'd survive it. And uh, what happens is, is that site of infection where the flea would bite you, you would get this kind of swelling or uh, also known as a, a bubo from bubonic around the site of infection. And that's actually your body's own immune system uh, trying to kind of fight off the infection. It's a, a swelling in that area. But then you'd get kind of fever, headache, uh, weakness. Uh, some people would kind of get delirium, you know, uh, from it as well. And also you get this kind of, um, if it was left untreated, uh, which it was in those days, uh, you would get this kind of necrosis or a death of the skin, uh, which would, the skin would kind of turn this black colour, which is why it was known as the Black Death. And as I say, it, it was really very unpleasant disease and you would die quite quickly from it once you once you got infected. Mm-hmm. Now, obviously, this was a catastrophe for people living in Ireland. But as you said, the political situ- situation of the country was very complicated at the time. You mm-hmm. had English mm-hmm. enclaves, Irish enclaves. But one of the things that's generally said about the plague in Ireland was that it contracted the English colony in Ireland. Can you mm. talk a little bit about that? Yeah, well, it, it, it seems to have been that, I mean, as you said, there was the kind of Anglo-Irish colony there. But it, they really think, because the plague was also rife, of course, in England and in Ireland, First of all, the, the population would have been reduced. People were still kind of trying to recover all sorts of things. They recover businesses, trying to, you know, grow crops again. So they probably didn't really have much time for kind of, uh, you know, coming to Ireland to conquer. But also there was, uh, there's a point being made that there was actually more land available. So, you know, they weren't sending over people to colonise. People didn't really need to do that. They gave an example of, I think, the Duke of Surrey in the later part of the uh, 14th century. Uh, he called for a man and wife from every parish in England to come to Ireland and inhabit the said land where it was wasted on the marches. But apparently nobody answered his call. Oh dear. So there wasn't <laughs> enough, not enough English settlers to go around. Yeah, this is it. Yeah, yeah. Um, one final question. The Black Death is obviously the most catastrophic plague, but the plague did recur in Ireland, isn't that true? It, the, the Black Death? Mm-hmm. Or the bubonic plague, no? It's, yeah, I mean, there would have been subsequent kind of um, uh, epidemics, you know, of the plague. And I mean, even throughout Europe, like there was a, a great plague in Marseille in the 1600s. I think there would have also been a more localised outbreaks of the plague uh, around that area. And that's usually what kind of... Um, diseases do basically once there's a pandemic they will kind of come back in cycles until they kind of basically burn themselves out almost it is kind of a um you know the the way that they they go and this kind of happened even today like there's still cases of the plague not not in ireland now but even in the states there's still kind of very isolated uh, cases of plague in the states and in in parts of asia now i know you touched on earlier about uh, Mm -hmm. friar clean but I must yeah. ask you to talk about it again, just the type of language he used in his entries and uh, mm-hmm. how that tied into the whole apocalyptic view of the plague. Yeah, and I mean, that you would see that especially amongst the, the, the priests. And I mean, Europe was kind of no exception for that. You know, they, 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 they all had this kind of very dramatic language that it was a judgment uh, from God and people must repent for their for their sins and everything. But, uh, I mean, Friar Clin is kind of, I have to say from what I've read from him, he's quite, he's, he's very good at uh, observing, you know, kind of what, what, and documenting what had happened. He recounts that there was hardly a house and at least one had not died. Describes the villages of scarcely, scarcely having anyone left alive. And even his very last entry in the annals is very dramatic. Um, not long after recording the deaths of Friars in Kilkenny, 
he it kind of it's almost like a plea to continue the, this work like he emphasizes the importance of recording the events that are happening and then he, he he leaves it with quite a dramatic statement saying that he's leaving parchment for continuing the work if there be any ra- race of adam uh, left to write about it and then that his annals are actually cut short after that there's another hand that is actually um writes um here it seems the author died and it's quite likely that he succumbed to the plague at this uh, um, himself at this stage. Now, if we could just move on to the influenza pandemic mm, in 1918, mm-hmm. uh, one yeah. of the questions I think people people ask is, is why was it called the Spanish flu? Yeah, this is kind of interesting because it. it I mean, sometimes flus, uh, influenza, it, it kind of gets called after about where it originates. So they believed that, it, um, at the time, should I say, they believed it originated in Spain. But the thing is, it's probably more likely that it originated in the, um, you know, in France or England or from the, the troops there, because, of course, World War One was going on uh, at the time. And um, they think one theory that they think that Spain got kind of blamed with it is that there is Spain, of course, was uh, neutral at the, that time in World War One, And um, there was no censorship as such as the media so there was a lot of reports um, going on about the flu and it, 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 it breaking out and everything whereas in England and France they were trying to kind of keep the morale up so any there, there wasn't any really negative reports about the, the flu being there even though it certainly was so it just kind of got um, uh, blamed for that but I think even at the time though uh, there was kind of uh, other loyalties or you know coming up where they would kind of blame certain whoever somebody was at war with there was blames of the Russian flu as well from uh, other countries and things like that so but it just the Spanish flu is the one that kind of seemed to stick and this flu killed almost as many people or maybe more than the first world war so it was an exceptionally deadly Mm. type of flu isn't that right it was a very very virulent type of flu really I mean, I actually think it's, you know, you could probably say that that was, this is probably the worst medical catastrophe in in human kind of recorded history. They think in Ireland alone, it probably killed about 20,000 people within that kind of short time, 1918 to 1919. And they think that, it's hard to say, but they think that it was probably between 50 to 100 million people that died worldwide. And what was different about this strain of flu to previous strains? The thing about it is, like, normally with influenza, so it's a, it's actually a viral infection, and normally with it is you will get infected, you get kind of a high temperature, chills, you know, sore throat, but you usually, if you're healthy, you'll recover after a few weeks. It's usually only if you're kind of very old or very um, uh, young or you're in some way kind of, you know, immunocompromised that the flu is is a risk for you. But with this type of flu, it was just the particular um, genetic variation of the virus that turned out to be really, really virulent. And the problem was is that it actually affected um, the young and the strong a lot more than it would somebody who was very young or very old. And what happened was it would actually turn your immune system against you and cause what's known as a, a cytokine storm in your body. So basically your immune system, if you were young and healthy and you got infected, your immune system would overreact and really, really turn against you, you know, turn itself against you. And if people would die very suddenly and very, very horribly, I must add, like you'd have the normal symptoms of flu, but basically people's internal organs kind of started shutting down and there was a lot of, they would bleed from their mouth and nose and ears and there was a lot of reports of people almost drowning in their own blood as they died and these, as I say, would be quite young, healthy people a few days beforehand. We talked about the Black Death being seen at the time as kind of the mm. apocalypse or this, you know, the scourge of God or something like that. Yes. What yes. was the social reaction to the 1918 flu, the Spanish flu? The flu, I mean, it was interesting. There was a lot of kind of, I think some, they kind of, because, of course, World War I was going on at the time, um, there was a lot of suggestions that it was, you know, a a lot to do with this, that it was the kind of the dead bodies, it was the troops, it was a miasma that had formed over the troops that had swept across Europe and things like that. That was kind of the reaction of it. Now, 
there have been great advances made in kind of modern medicine uh, around kind of the end of the 19th century. They were beginning to kind of put forward the germ theory and they'd found vaccines for a, a number of kind of serious diseases. And actually they'd identified the carrier of the Black Death as well, or the, the bacteria it was actually in the, the Pasteur Institute. So they were actually at almost a golden age in medicine, but then this kind of flu almost came out of nowhere and it really knocked the medical community for six. They really, you know, had never seen anything like it. And there's reports of some of the junior doctors in the matter kind of, they thought it was some form of new form of plague. They they really didn't know what it was. And what was the reaction of the authorities in Ireland? Mm. Well, I think they tried their best. Now, of course, Ireland at the time was having its own problems with that. But really, I mean, they they tried their best, especially in the medical community. They were overrun. They were really overrun uh, because so many people were ill. And there was reports of kind of doctors and nurses just, you know, kind of working throughout the day and night, trying to trying to nurse people back to health. There was a lot of kind of events that were shut down purposely because of that, because, you know, large gatherings of people obviously ended up with, you know, greater spreading the infection and, um, you know, things like kind of balls and dances and, uh, you know, films, things like that were shut down an awful lot. But it really had, uh, you know, a very bad effect on the medical community. And I mean, you can tell us, you can see it in some of their writings that like they really are kind of very frustrated that they can't do more. And people get very frustrated with them as well, you know, because they they feel like they, they should be able to call out a doctor to kind of tend their families, of course. But um, they they just had far too much to kind of do. So it really was, um, you know, it it really was quite disastrous. If I happen to study this particular year, just uh, following Mm -hmm. the life of a Sinn Féin activist in Cavan, and he does note in his diaries and his letters that everyone's getting the flu and uh, his girlfriend got the flu. When he went to the Sinn Féin Congress, people in Cavan, Sinn Féin got the flu. And the RIC in the county, their reports say, you know, everyone's very concerned about this. So it really was probably... Uh, even at the time of the 1918 election when Ireland declared independence, it was probably the most important event in the country. Yeah, uh, oh, I would say so. And I mean, there was, um, I think they were worried in some areas that actually it would there be low election turnout and everything just because of the flu. Um, and, you know, it, it really did end up uh, having quite an effect of people. And I mean, even afterwards, when people were counted, they they kind of say it was one of the worst things they've ever seen. You know, everybody would wake up the next morning and kind of gather around and ask who had died during the night. It was that bad. And how did it impact on the independence movement and the uh, individuals involved as activists? Well, I think there was a number of prisoners who were um, in jail because of the the so-called German plot. I believe, and especially I think they were in jails there was uh, up in Belfast and the flu swept through there, a lot of them ended up quite quite sick and uh, coming a man, they were meant to be in such kind of bad conditions that coming a man actually offered to go in and kind of uh, nurse them but they were told that they didn't need any outside help and I think eventually they did kind of get some proper medical attention for them in the end but there was a number, um, some of the prisoners actually died. I think there was a prisoner in Wales, uh, Richard Coleman. He became ill of the flu and died. And there was an outrage, of course. He was compared to Thomas Ashe. Uh, later on, uh, Pierce McCann, um, he uh, also died. He was actually an MP for Tipperary East. And I think with this and... There was another kind of wave of the, the, the flu struck. There was a lot of pressure on the British government to actually release the prisoners. And it's actually, the flu really caused them to do this. Uh, they, they released uh, a lot of prisoners. I think Arthur Griffiths was amongst one of the first prisoners to be released. And they, they were released and brought uh, Pearson Cowan's body back with them. And just as well, when we look at Dublin and the uh, larger cities in Ireland at that time, when we look at the problems with tenements and sanitation, mm-hmm. how did this play into the spread of influenza? Yeah, I mean, definitely it would have been those that were kind of less well off who would have uh, fared worse when it came to the flu, even though it did affect everybody, of course, but the poor conditions wouldn't have helped. And, uh, 
you know, sanitation. There was an emphasis, funnily enough, they, because of the germ theory, that there was an emphasis from the medical community a bit more than there had been for, for people to kind of keep clean and wash their hands. And there was a lot of ads for kind of um, super antibacterial liquids that can save you from the flu and everything. So basically, it really did affect us in kind of a bad way for the poorer of the country. Well, unfortunately, we don't have time to talk about potato blight, but we'll have to have you back no, on no. again to talk about that. But thank you very much for talking to us today about the Black Death and the uh, Spanish flu. And that was Dr. Aoife McCormick, who works at the Biomedical Diagnostics Institute in Dublin City University. Today we're joined by James Durney from Kildare. James is a military historian who's written books on subjects such as the Irish in Vietnam, on World War One. His latest book is on Kildare in the Irish Civil War. But we're talking to him about his article in the Irish Sword Journal when Ainger Street became the Dardanelles. So thanks for joining us, James. Hello, glad to be here with you. Um, Most people will know, James, that the Dardanelles or Gallipoli was a very bloody battle in the First World War where many Irishmen died. But how did a street in Dublin become known as the Dardanelles during the War of Independence? Well, it was just that around uh, the summer of 1920, the Dublin district issued a list of 12 bad areas in terms of high rebel activity. And uh, one of these, of course, was the Andrew Street, Camden Street area that ran down to Dublin Castle from Portobello Barracks. And uh, ambushes became so frequent there that uh, the British soldiers and uh, auxiliaries that were, were, were running along here, they called this the Dardanelles because it was a series of narrow streets, a bit like the Dardanelles. And it even had uh, one part of the area known as the Narrows. And uh, this this how it became the to the British known as the Dardanelles. Mm-hmm. Um, the people doing this attack were the IRA, of course. Um, after the Easter Rising, how did the IRA in Dublin reorganise itself from its its defeat in the Rising? Well, they, they wouldn't really have considered it a defeat as such. Um, of course, when they reorganised, they were going to fight the war completely different. This conflict would not be a rerun of 1916. It was going to be on their terms uh, a conflict of assassinations and attacks on targets uh, that suited them rather than suited the British. They weren't going to be penned up in any buildings and that they were going to do the attacking and they were going to do it their way. And it it took a considerable amount of time to reorganise the IRA after 1916 through 1917, 18. It was all about organising, drilling, uh, rifle practice, stuff like that, raids for arms and that. It wasn't really until 1919 that the war was uh, really hotting up and then it was um, a series of assassinations and against the G Division in Dublin, the, the G Division of the Dublin Metropolitan Police, the intelligence section, really. Mm-hmm. Now, that was mostly the work of the squad, but would I be right in saying that? Yeah, this was a specially formed assassination squad. Uh, Mike, Mick Collins' 12 apostles, as they were known, there was more than 12 of them in it at most stages anyway, but uh, these were handpicked by Collins for assassinations in the Dublin city area and again it was mainly uh, G Division detectives that were singled out mm-hmm. but the squad of course went on then to be um, assassinating members of British intelligence that had come over then later on mm-hmm. And many, when many people think of the War of Independence in Dublin they'll think of that, the intelligence war but in the Dardanelles or on Andrew Street, Wexford Street, Camden Street, in that area, we see a different pattern. We see attacks on troops more and uh, auxiliaries, isn't that right? Yeah, they were, were attacking troops and mostly um, auxiliaries in and around that area and then British troops then as well. Um, probably the more attacks were on uh, the police rather than the military. It was only later on in the conflict that the military was targeted just as much. Mm-hmm. And the... Two units in particular, I see in your article, were responsible for the attacks uh, in the streets, the street ambushes. One of them is the Dublin Active Service Unit, and the other one is the 3rd Battalion of the Dublin Brigade. Can you say something about those units? Well, see, the Dublin Brigade was, was consisted of four battalions, and uh, the 3rd Battalion was responsible for the South Liffey area. So this was the area of where uh, Ainge Street at Arnanal was, actually. So that was their sphere of operation. Um there was two battalions on the north side and two battalions on the south side. Now, later on, as the the conflict continued, um, most of these battalions formed their own active service units. And these were guys that were full-time and were fully paid. These were paid something like 
four pound ten shillings a week, and like the squad, they were full time. They were completely different, of course, but for bigger operations, the active service unit of each battalion would come together, maybe to forward them all together for something like the custom house attack. Um, the whole active service unit was brought together, as was the squad, and uh, augmented then by men from different battalions of the Dublin Brigade. Mm-hmm. The active service guys were really, they were the kind of first professional um, volunteers in the Dublin Brigade area. Mm-hmm. And can you describe what we're talking about when we talk about attacks on the what was called the Dardanelles? What, what did it look like in ambush, an IRA ambush at this time? Um, at this stage, like you're talking about um, a couple of guys getting together. It, was what, it started off as patrolling would patrol the area hoping that they'd come up against um, a British truck or a British car or anything at all. And this was the most common activity um, in the latter half of 1920 and into 21. And these were going out on patrol. There could be 20, 30 men. Now, at the, what they would be carrying would be grenades, homemade bombs and revolvers, maybe a few automatics. They didn't bring um, rifles on, on a an ambush like this because they don't really work in an urban area. If you want to melt back into the crowd, it's easier just to stick a revolver in your pocket and disappear through the crowd at streets. And this is what they would do. They would wait in. For ambushes then, they would actually wait in side streets. You see along there if you drive along it. And I still drive along it, and the, and the area hasn't really changed at all. If you look at little streets like Degas streets or lanes or anything, these guys would be standing in around there waiting for something to go by, lob a couple of grenades, let off a few shots with the hope of hitting anyone. It didn't really always work out like that. I mean, there was a lot of attacks, but very very few fatal casualties. Civilians probably took as much of the brunt as uh, the, the military or uh, police did because um, they just happened to be in the line of fire from both sides. Hi, James. I was just wondering... Um that strip of Dublin, as you were describing, from Portobello Barracks, when you come up through uh, Camden Street all the way up to Angel Street and Georgia Street, um, it has a lot of high buildings on either side, three- and four-storey buildings. Would the volunteers ever use the opportunity of sniper attacks or was always, or were the ambushes always conducted from ground level? No, they actually did use them from the buildings, tops of buildings or, or from um, windows of two-storey buildings or whatever. The whole idea was to drop a grenade into the back of a lorry that would be the big thing it, the only were successful at one stage when they dropped one into um a british army truck that was that had a cordon around the area around wexford street and they killed two british soldiers um they would fire revolvers drop grenades from higher buildings all right but never really snipers i've never come across any any use of um rifles in in that area for sniping but what they would do was hopefully wait and drop, as I say, a grenade or fire a couple of shots at anything going by. Mm-hmm. James, you mentioned civilian casualties uh, and you mentioned that Angel Street is much the same then as now. And one of the things that one will notice about the street is that there's many street traders selling vegetables, selling flowers. It's a crowded street um, now and, and I think was then as well. So was it kind of reckless for the IRA to be launching attacks like this? Was there many civilian, civilian casualties? Yeah, there would have, would have been a lot now of us. Um, a lot of the action now around that area, the civilians would have suffered, as in most wars now, most modern wars, civilians tend to suffer an awful lot. And that, as you said, it would have been full of traders, it would have been full of people walking up and down, doing their, their weekly shopping. The weekly shopping was done on a Saturday evening, and uh, at one stage there was an attack and a woman was killed, which left um, a lot of children without their mother. So that cattle brewer was, was incensed over this and he decided that there would be no more attacks on a Saturday evening because it was the busiest time of, of the week. And the, the guys had a, their reaction to it was that the Saturday ambush is postponed until Monday. Hmm. So they didn't, uh, they, the IRA men weren't too concerned with civilian casualties or they shrugged no, it off? Well, they were, I'm sure they were concerned because it's, it's their own people they're, they're fighting among. And, I mean, the traders got to know them after a while. They would see these guys coming, and uh, they would just melt away. And uh, they were always great for a hand, for taking in weapons or taking in dispatches as well. Or if a guy was running away, he could always dump a revolver, someone to pick it up from. They were, they were very friendly towards one another. There doesn't seem to be much animosity from the civilians towards 
um, the IRA and more animosity towards the British shoes. Well, their, their fire would have been just as indiscriminate as the IRA and they probably wounded or killed as many people as, as the IRA did. But, I mean, they, they're the ones that didn't seem to, to get much stick. It was mostly the British. Well, uh, I was just wondering what the response was from the British Army. Did they recommend that or order that uh, troops would, would cease to use that route into Dublin? Uh, would they start to use alternative routes? Or would they they start using extra patrols, like patrol more heavily? Well, they didn't they didn't change the routes anyway. I suppose if changing the routes would have been a, um, an admission of defeat or, or in some way. So what they would have done then, what they were really preparing for was that the conflict was beginning to escalate around the summer of 1921 and uh, the British were changing their tactics. They were adapting their tactics to the IRA and... Um, just so they could confront them and probably defeat them. They were putting out more patrols, they were putting up pickets, cordons, um, lookout posts on higher buildings and all. They were getting prepared for a long war at the time, and uh, as were the IRA, and the truce comes along then, and they're just, they're just both sides taking a breathing space, but the politicians had decided different, and uh, there was no need for... But the British Army was adapting, as, as they always do, you know, and then the, the IRA have to change their tactics too. Mm-hmm. Um, in your article, you list the casualties for Dublin, which are surprisingly high. I mean, they're over 450, I think. Um, but also, the, you see the number of IRA prisoners taken by the British is increasing in those last two months of the of the war. So do you think if the truce hadn't come along, what would have happened to the IRA in Dublin? Um, yeah, well, I mean, uh, by the, the truce, you have about 5,000 men uh behind the wire or behind the, the jail walls. And the British were in, increasingly getting better at their intelligence and that. But the War of Independence was primarily a, a Dublin and Munster affair. And uh, there was considerable tension as which of the two was most important. But if the capital could not be contained, there's little hope for the rest of the country. And Ned Bry, who was a, I must point out, was a Killerman as well and worked for hmm. Michael Collins as, as his, one of his main intelligence men in the castle, he says Cork and Kerry could be wiped out, but as long as Dublin was there, the war was guaranteed. So it was essential that Dublin keep fighting and that um, the British did not uh, control Dublin. Mm-hmm. However, if um, things had worked out longer, I think it would have just ended up like the, the recent troubles in Northern Ireland. You would have seen um, how, you know, you've seen from up to the 19, mid-1970s how high the casualties were, how... Um, high the amount of attacks and that and then they just petered out into a kind of an acceptable level of violence and that's probably what have happened in um in dublin at the same time if the war had continued mm-hmm. um of course what we know we we can't speculate what might have happened but what did happen was there was a truce and then unfortunately there was a, a civil war so how did the men who ambushed and who fought on, on the dardanelles and so-called in the war of independence end up in the civil war well, mostly the active service unit and um, the the squad, they kind of were, they began to, they formed a, what was called the Dublin Guard. And these were uh, pro-treaty, most of these. So most of the squad and the active service unit. After the Customs House um, attack, uh, the squad, what was remained of the squad and the active service unit came, units came together and formed the Dublin Guard. Now, during the Civil War, these became pro-treaty. These were Collins' crack um, troops, and uh, they formed the basis of the National Army. So a lot of them went against the treaty. Where a lot of the rank and file in the Dublin Brigade, I felt, uh, kind of went anti-treaty. So the guys you're talking about in um, the Danger Street area, the, Dar- the Dardanelles, they, to me, would have been um, more anti-treaty. And a lot of these, a couple of these guys would have ended up executed by their own side in the Civil War. Mm-hmm. And in the Civil War itself, do we know, was there a similar pattern? Was the Dardanelles used again as a, a an ambush point? No, it's something I haven't really studied. But um, again, it was because it was much of a, much the same. We were, we're still using the same barracks and the same areas the, the National Army was. So there was a lot of attacks on them. But uh, whether it you know, was the same as it was during the War of Independence, 
it needs a, a bit of work on maybe just to see whether it was. It, at the time, my part of the study was just uh, the War of Independence, but I'd like to have a look at it and see that it continue into the Civil War as the same sort of an area. Now, James, one of the big um, landmarks on Anger Street, uh, for most people who know the area, is Whitefriars Church, and that would have been... Um, uh, a centre for people going to Mass on a Saturday night or a Sunday morning or Holy Days. Uh, did the authorities within Whitefriars Church or the Catholic Church as a whole uh, have any objections, serious objections to the IRA's campaign in the area? No, they seem to be a little bit uh, sympathetic now actually to um, to the the IRA in the area. And at, at one stage there was allegedly uh, shots fired from the Priory in, in Whitefire Street and it was actually raided then by British Army troops afterwards and uh, looking for arms or ammunition and that. A couple of people were arrested in the local area. But there doesn't seem to be much, um, from the accounts at the time, there doesn't seem to be much of a of a backlash against the IRA from the church authorities in that area. Mm-hmm. OK, James Durney, thank you very much. Thank you. Now, John, we were just interviewing James Durney there about the uh, the attacks on British forces through that strip of Dublin from uh, Camden Street up to Angel Street, Georgia Street direction. Could you tell us something about the makeup of the IRA in Dublin at that set of time? Yeah, well, if you trace it from the split in the Irish Volunteers in 1914 up until uh, 1921, um, the social profile of the IRA is generally... Uh, young, first of all, and they get younger. I mean, they're, the average volunteer in the Easter Rising is in his late 20s, and by the time of the truce, he's in his very early 20s or late teens, and in the Civil War, they're even younger again. But as regards their social background, most of them, again, there's a kind of a coming down, if you like, because at the, in the Easter Rising, most of them are skilled workers from that kind of background. And increasingly, you're, they're attracting um, younger and unskilled men uh, in the rank and file. Now, the other, the interesting thing about the IRA is that uh, in the officers, you generally have uh, skilled workers or white collar workers, the middle classes. So there's an interesting class thing in the IRA where it sort of mirrors Irish society rather than being a class conscious organisation. And how is the IRA divided in Dublin in terms of different units and different responsibilities? Well, yeah, again, the Volunteers, remember, was founded, first of all, as sort of a, a parading army in a way at the start. And later on, viewed as almost a kind of Irish regular army in, in waiting. So it has this structure, which in guerrilla warfare is, is not necessarily reflecting reality. But um, there's four battalions. There's two north of the Liffey. There's two south of the Liffey. Um, but as things ha- as the decision is taken really by Michael Collins and Richard Mulcahy in 1919 to to use violence, to use assassinations, and I don't mean to say that there was not also British pressure, but the decision was taken that they were going to use they were going to use violence in a, at first a very surgical way. They were going to assassinate people. They were going to assassinate the G Division of the Dublin Metropolitan Police, the detectives. They were going to assassinate British intelligence. They were going to assassinate also people who were investigating things like the Dáil Loan. The guy who was investigating that was was shot in a tram. But anyway, they formed the squad, the assassination unit of the IRA, to do that, to assassinate people. And initially that was sort of the fighting unit of the Dublin IRA. Um, as things developed, they needed a combat unit. And they formed, as James has talked about, they formed the ASU. Now, there was a central ASU. There was also ASUs in each battalion area. So there was basically company guys uh, who did the fighting. And as I said, fighting in this context, there were fighting in this context means uh, ambushes, it means grenades, it means revolvers. It doesn't mean a stand-up fight. There were specific orders that they were not to do this. Um, because Collins had been in the Easter Rising, so at Mulcahy, they were very aware of what would happen if they were drawn to a stand-up fight, that they had limited amount of weapons, limited amount of volunteers, and that they'd be used up very quickly. Although the propaganda value might be good, they would be captured or killed if they got involved in a stand-up fight. And in the only occasion when there was um, several hundred volunteers involved in an action, as in the Customs House raid, that's of course what happened. There was four of them killed. And there was oh, nearly 100 captured, I think 70 or 80. But um, most of those volunteers who were involved in that action, the burning of the Customs House, the burning of the centre of local government, which was obviously a great propaganda stroke, but most of the people who were involved in that were not actually armed. There wasn't enough arms in Dublin to go around. So more or less that was how the IRA was organised in it. Um, as James was talking there beforehand about uh, civilian casualties, it's also an area that you've looked at quite a, quite a bit. And if we were to take the War of Independence and the Civil War together, mm. um, what type of operations continued on through that period in Dublin and what was the effect on civilian casualties in Dublin? 
Yeah, well, what's interesting about this is that this has only started to be researched very, very recently. I mean, uh, you know, Halpin, whom we interviewed uh, the other week, has been doing a study and he's found 320 dead in Dublin for the War of Independence alone. And um, by a very rough count, uh, I have, I think, a little bit less than 200 in the Civil War. Now, I, it's it's not much more than that. It might be a little bit less. But that's about 500 over roughly two, three years. You know, it's roughly from December 1920 or November 1920 when it starts getting very violent in Dublin up until the middle of 1923. So that's short of three years. Um, so it's about 500 dead. There's also a significant number of wounded and roughly half of them, or possibly a little bit more than half, are civilians. How are they killed? How are they hit? They're hit usually in these street ambushes, which, as you said, um, we do find more or less consistent without, throughout the period. Kind of reckless actions on the whole. You've got, you, you throw a, a grenade at a passing lorry, you fire some shots with a revolver and you try to get away. Is the standard IRA action of these years, both in the War of Independence and in the Civil War. And ironically, of course, some of the people who were on the receiving end in the Civil War had been the ones carrying it out in the in the earlier period. And um, to those type of uh, ambushes from the IRA during the War of Independence and the anti-treaty IRA during the Civil War, could you compare the response of the British government during the War of Independence to the response of the provisional government during the Civil War to very similar type of tactics? Yeah, um, it's an obvious thing to say, but... Obviously, one came first and the other one came after and they could learn the lessons of what had gone before. So that, that makes a difference. It also makes a difference that the provisional government or the free state government, the pro-treaty side, uh, were in the main former IRA people, right? The military command had been in the IRA. Um, Charlie Dalton in military intelligence. Tom Ennis, who was the head of the uh, National Army, Dublin Brigade. All, all ex-IRA men, they knew who the people they were trying to get were for the most part, although some of them had been too young to be in the War of Independence but certainly their leaders the likes of Ernie O'Malley and Oscar Trainer, both of whom were picked up fairly early on had been prominent in the IRA and the great success that the Free State side had in the Civil War was that they knew where to find people where to pick them up who they were and they arrested a great number of them I mean we talk a lot about the atrocities of the Civil War and there were lots of atrocities and assassinations but actually the most common by far experience of an anti-treaty fighter in the Civil War is arrest mostly while unarmed mostly while surprised and OK, occasionally some, some of them were shot, but mostly they were arrested. Around 12,000 were arrested. I don't have the figure in Dublin, but it's the figure is quite high. I mean, it's certainly over 1,000 anti-treaty people arrested in Dublin. That's the first thing. The second thing is that the Free State is considerably more ruthless than the British. The British um, executed, I think, the number is 14 um, people in the War of Independence. Officially, there were obviously a lot more people taken out just and shot by the auxiliaries, people like that, including in Dublin. Um and there are a lot of assassinations also by the British in Dublin. There's three people who were shot in Drumcondra, um, and there's a great scandal about that. There's three people who were murdered in Dublin Castle on the night of Bloody Sunday. Um, but in both executions, and also I should say the British executed, um, I think ten people in Dublin, uh, hanged them actually, you know, including Kevin Barry very famously, and the so-called Forgotten Ten who were mostly captured in, a, in an action in Pier Street. But the British. While they did do these things, assassinations and executions, the Free State were much more thorough, if you like. They used terror in a more thorough way. They did much more assassin- many more assassinations. There's at least 20, 21 assassinations in Dublin um, carried out covertly. There's another, I mean, of this, of the 80 or 81, I think is the number of official executions, 30 or 40 of them are in Dublin. Mm-hmm. You know, there's quite a, the Free State is quite ruthless. They're not so worried about the British as about alienating public opinion because by and large they know Irish opinion is on their side. They've quite clear objectives which the British didn't have. So in a lot of ways the British response is much more ruthless. Um in terms of combating assassinations in the street, which we talked about are similar in both periods, um arrests and so forth took a toll, but basically they're the pro treaty soldiers, the National Army soldiers are in the same predicament as the British soldiers were in in their years before that, in that they're in a reactive role. They're getting attacked, they don't know from where. By the time they've got themselves organized uh, their attackers have largely got away, and that explains some of the atrocities on on guerrillas in both in both of those periods. Mm. Um, the British, on the whole, were much more indiscriminate about shooting at civilians. I mean, a lot of the attacks in James's very very good article on the Dardanelles in Dublin. Um, what you see is that the British get attacked, grenades are thrown at them, and they fire in all directions, and they hit a lot a lot of people, and they shoot a lot of people at uh, roadblocks when they don't stop, which uh, you know Halpin has mentioned to us. Um, the Free State troops do that, but they don't do so much of it. They don't do nearly so much of it. They're much more um, considerate, if you like, 
or, or they're much more worried about causing civilian casualties or at any, at any rate they don't do it so much um, there's one occasion where they do uh, fire a protest of women um, on O'Connell Street protesting against Republican prisoners and there are occasions where they shoot people by mistake but not nearly so many as the British so in, in short you can sum it up is the free state intelligence is much better than the British oh. um, they're much more ruthless in a way but they're more sparing on civilians well could that have something to do with the fact that they are actually Irish of course, um, of course. There are in many cases drawn from Dublin um, themselves. But in terms of the IRA in Dublin, as James was saying, like uh, the active service unit and the squad, um, the coming of the treaty, the signing of the treaty, what was the reaction like within the Dublin IRA to the signing of the treaty, um, particularly within Colin's squad? Um, well, with those, there's two kind of elite units in the IRA. Like you mentioned, there's the active service unit and the squad. And those people are very, very close to Collins. Collins, during the War of Independence, would meet them after every operation and would go drinking with them, actually. And this became a problem because they were drinking too much. And um, whatever they thought about the treaty, if they had a worked out political position on the treaty, I don't know. But they were very close to Michael Collins. Michael Collins told them the treaty is a good thing and mm-hmm. they went along with him. And they were the elite of the Free State, if you like, in the Civil War. They were also the most ruthless people in the Civil War. Mm-hmm. They did almost all the atrocities of the Civil War were carried out by people who had been in the squad or the active service unit in Dublin or they were involved in them. Um, the anti-treaty IRA, James perceptively remarked, um, the rank and file of the Dublin IRA, the Dublin Brigade, who had been increasingly involved in the War of Independence as it went on, because originally it was just the squad, then it was the active service unit, then all the companies had to, ha- had to carry out one action every week, which spreads the load of violence, if you like, much more widely. But those people in the Dublin Brigade who didn't have this special relationship with Michael Collins, who were closer to their own leaders, people like uh, Oscar Trainer, um, they were predominantly anti-treaty and they were the people who occupied the four courts. They were the people who occupied a Street at the start of the Civil War. Well, do you think the fact that um, the squad is almost unanimously uh, pro-treaty and very, very committed to Michael Collins uh, and these are held up as the, uh, the elite of the Dublin IRA, the fact that the majority of the rank-and-file members of the IRA go anti-treaty. Do you think that means perhaps that there was uh, a tension there during the War of Independence between the squad and rank and file IRA members? Or maybe there was a resentment towards the squad and maybe a resentment towards the special relationship between the squad and Collins? I couldn't say exactly if there's a resentment in the rank and file because I, I haven't seen that mm. in my book, but it's, it's quite possible. Uh, but we, What we do know for sure though is that the people in the squad and the ASU uh, had, did have this elitist attitude where they considered they wouldn't let anyone else into their circle. Now, obviously, there's security reasons for this because they could be informers and they could be taken out and killed, which, of course, did happen. Um, but they they did think of themselves as, uh, if you like, the elite of the IRA and they, they certainly didn't associate with the normal rank-and-file members of the IRA in Dublin. Um, so, and, of course, you, you get this reflect, reflected in the Civil War to some degree where they say we have no time for trucers. We're the real fighters. The real fighters are pro-treaty. So, yeah, you, you certainly do get a split there. I mean, I think um, it might be a matter for further research how that works both ways, you know. Yeah, but it is curious that their support for this treaty wouldn't translate into influencing the vast bulk of the Dublin IRA to also follow the treaty. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. I think I think there's definitely indications that, that there's a resentment there, all right. Mm-hmm. And on that note, uh, just thank you very much there, John, and also thank you to James Dorney. And if we can give you his website, you can check out some of his articles uh, there on www.jamesdurney.com. That's D-U-R-N-E-Y.